Okay. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ben Kropowski, and I'm the director of the Unify Consortium. I wanted to just put this slide up as a little bit of an intro to let you know that we're kicking off this semester's uh, talks. Uh, again, these talks are uh, every spring and fall, Mondays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. You do need to re-register, so we send out a, a reminder about that so that it can appear on your calendar. Registration can also be done at the Unified Consortium website. You see the link there below. Also, there's a QR code in the upper left that will get you to that site. And seminars are posted on our YouTube channel, and they'll be posted fairly shortly once we complete them. So I'm going to go ahead and get uh, discussing on our topic today. Okay, so I'm going to highlight uh, updates to what we've been doing in the grid forming consortium to date, as well as talk about specifications that we just released in December of this year. So just to remind people, the UNIFI consortium, UNIFI stands for Universal Interoperability for Grid Forming Inverters. It's really meant to bring together researchers, industry, stakeholders, utilities, system operators, anyone that's interested in the grid forming space. And really we're trying to collaboratively pursue how to make sure that we unify the integration of inverter-based resources with the traditional power system. So again, I'll just highlight at a, at a high level the need for grid forming inverters. Um, sometime last year, uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab published a pretty extensive study that was examining supply side options to achieve 100% clean electricity by 2035. So this is a really a significant look at how we can actually reach 100% clean electricity. Um, but the one thing that I wanted to highlight out of that report is the fact that if we look at the future power grid, and we want to achieve clean electricity at the least cost. Right now, those types of systems look like they would be comprised of majority wind and solar energy, providing 60 to 80 percent of the total electricity. That is a big change from where we are today um, and um, a huge deployment over the next decade or two something on the order of a combined two terawatts or wind of wind and solar would be deployed into the system. Now, this is a big challenge, and there's a lots of issues with how we actually can achieve this level of uh, integration, but I'll specifically focus on the need uh, around how these inverter-based resources will be connected to the electric power grid. So if we take a closer look at existing systems that are operating with high levels of inverter-based resources, and um, you can use percent wind and solar on the y-axis as a proxy for inverter-based resource, and then system size on the bottom, the x-axis, from very small island power grids to large-scale uh, interconnections. And if you take a look at this graph, two important points. First off is the uh, gray circles, those are annual energy amounts. And then the red squares show you instantaneous levels that they have been able to achieve by running those systems. If you look at the small island power grids, you can see we've been uh, very successful in operating these systems with inverter-based resources and high levels of wind and solar. Um, but then as we get larger and larger systems, that numbers come down considerably. Um, and if we're talking about trying to get the entire United States to be operating somewhere between 60 to 80 percent on an annual energy basis, we need to figure out how we get these larger scale grids to look like the small island power grids in terms of amount of wind and solar deployed. If we take a look at this kind of curve that you see on the graph now, what we need to do is raise that up so that we're getting instantaneous levels up over 90, close to 100%, even for the largest systems. And that will enable us to get these annual energy values up over 50 
uh, to 80 percent. Again, it'll be critical because you'll have times in the year when you're going to be operating a mostly wind, solar, battery energy storage system that's going to be comprised of mostly inverter-based resources. Now, there's a variety of technical challenges that need to be addressed when we look at these types of systems. And I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. I'll just show this real quickly. But things like stability, protection, grid forming, and black start capability, and being able to damp out any type of power system oscillations will be critical for enabling this. And while this is a list of the challenges, the Unified Consortium really was designed to try to address these types of issues. So if we think about what's been deployed to date, it's been mostly what we call grid following inverters or GFL. These grid following inverters basically are current uh, control devices and need another source to provide that voltage waveform in order to synchronize to. Whereas grid forming technologies actually are controlled by the output voltage and can even make their own voltage waveform, therefore, therefore providing black start capability. There's a variety of benefits when you start to look at grid forming inverter technology. They can maintain system voltage. They have very fast response to disturbances. Again, black start capability, which is critical for enabling uh, power systems to return from abnormal uh, or blackout conditions. Also, they can enable higher levels of wind and solar to be integrated into grids. And that can be shown from that graph I showed you earlier. There's sort of a limit when you are just using grid following inverter technology. Um, you can't really be pushing that much over 70, 75% without um, coming up with additional power system issues. They can improve overall system reliability and resilience, and they can provide added economic value by providing essential grid reliability services. So again, grid forming inverters are really gonna be a key uh, technology as we move forward on these types of systems with large amounts of renewables. So the Unified Consortium is this forum to address the fundamental challenges of integrating grid forming inverter technologies into power systems. We're trying to unify the integration of inverter-based resources and synchronous machines. We have a wide variety of topical areas that we've been uh, working on, including research and development, demonstration and commercialization, and outreach and training. And this project was started um, last January, uh, funded by the Department of Energy Solar Energy Technology Office and Wind Energy Technology Office as a way to bring the industry together to create a sustainable future in this area. Now, one of the big goals that we have had for this consortium is developing a set of specifications for grid forming technologies. And importantly, that would include things uh, from both a systems level or the high level grid level and the inverter level. So an individual inverter is going to have a set of requirements and the system that it's connecting to is probably going to have some set of grid codes or guidelines. But what we're trying to do is marry these two things together and come up with a set of specifications that both the system operators and utilities uh, can use to specify equipment and the vendors can build too. Uh, one of the challenges we have right now is there's not a lot of grid forming, uh, grid connected inverters out there on the market. It's a relatively new technology, unless you're looking at small scale island off-grid systems, but bringing these things together so that we can make this more commonplace is really the goal here. So one of the things that we have been trying to do is sit down and come up with a set of universal principles or rules um, and our entire consortium has been working on this where we've gotten had many meetings trying to figure out what's the best way to look forward at, and come up with a, a desired functionality of the future grid. Um, needs to be inclusive of existing principles, but there may be some things that we need to adjust. But coming up with these universal principles has been key. 
even getting people to use the same terminology um, and make sure that people have a good idea of what grid forming means, what grid following means, even things like um, uh, fast response characteristics and things like this all need to be defined. We've been working on developing a set of use cases so that we can both uh, demonstrate the desired functionality for grid forming technologies, but also use these use cases as a way to drive validation. And that validation could be mechanisms from modeling and simulation to actual hardware deployment and development, as well as large scale demonstrations. So we sat down and tried to work out this. Now, the next slide is kind of a, a huge list of these universal objectives for grid connected inverters and a variety of things that we want to these uh, devices to achieve. I'm not going to read through them. I realize there's a lot of information on this particular slide. But to summarize what uh, you saw in the last slide, first, we need to agree on what we think these grid forming uh, technologies actually need to do. So things like support seamless transitions between grid connected and islanded mode, use system frequency as this universal power sharing parameter uh, in AC power systems. That's really what we use frequency for as a way of understanding if there's enough generation to meet the load. Um, allow you to do dynamic exchange of energy to realize appropriate inertial or damping uh, response characteristics. And there's a variety of uh, these types of things of what we really would like grid forming technologies to do. So we started off with this idea of a bunch of objectives, and then we're like, okay, let's start to work on something that would look like a set of specifications that could come out of this. And uh, we just published this in December. It is our version one of the specifications for grid forming inverter based resources. Uh, you see the QR code in the upper right. That'll link you directly to the document. Um, but these specifications really are meant to establish the functional requirements and performance criteria for integrating grid forming inverter based resources into electric power systems at any scale. And they provide a uniform set of technical requirements for the interconnection, integration, and interoperability of grid forming inverter based units and plants. Now, I will mention one thing this is version one. We actually foresee this being changed and pretty um, rapidly over the next year, but we wanted to get a document out there that covered a high level set of requirements and then work with industry start to get people familiar with what's in the document and get feedback so that we could update this to make it a more useful um, document in the future here. You can see the table of contents and I'll start to walk uh, my way through some of the information that's inside this particular document. Now this again, we take our universal objectives that I discussed a couple slides back and the new UNIFI specifications and tried to make sure that we could map all of the different objectives to the various sections listed in here. And we think we did a pretty good job of covering almost everything. Um, but again, there may be some things that we're missing and are looking for input from industry. So please uh, download the specifications, take a look through it, send your comments back to us. We'd love to get feedback on the current state of these documents. So let me just kind of walk through that document because it is kind of useful to, to look and see what it covers. So here's the scope and purpose. The scope uh, establishes functional requirements and performance criteria for these grid forming inverter based resources. It kind of covers the full range of uh, inverter based uh, systems that can be grid forming, including PV, wind turbines, HVDC, STATCOMs, UPS, and the variety of things listed here. The purpose really is just to perform, provide these uniform technical requirements so that we can map these specifications and make the entire industry have a roadmap for how to follow these into the future. So here's a, a little closer look at the universal performance requirements. So we wanted to make a section here that contains universal performance requirements. This means that all of the devices 
uh, should have these type of operating requirements for both normal and outside of normal conditions. So let's take a closer look at operations under normal grid conditions. So when we operate under normal conditions, we want these grid forming inverters, they're expected to really autonomously respond to changes, both transient and steady state based on their local measured signals. So that means measuring voltage, current, frequency uh, at the uh, point of connection. And that could be either done at an individual inverter or a plant because uh, some of these larger scale plants uh, contain lots of inverters. And you want to make sure that you're meeting those requirements back to where it interconnects to the rest of the power system. And we also want the these power outputs to be dispatchable. So it can be dispatchable either through a grid operator command or maybe by a locally determined goal. Um, again, we want it to respond quickly, uh, autonomously, but then also have that ability to be dispatched if needed. We also want them to be able to prov provide positive damping of voltage and frequency oscillations. Um, I show a little chart over on the right-hand side, and I want to um, throw out uh, some um, praise to go and check out one of our seminars from last fall from uh, KIUC and AES. KIUC is the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative. Um, but they have a lot of inverter-based resources on their power grid, and you can see some of the um, oscillations that they're starting to see due to a, very, a variety of different control algorithms used on those systems. But what we would like to see is that grid-forming inverters actually can dampen out these types of uh, control algorithm, algorithm oscillations. Um, and again, uh, I just want to, if you want to see a lot more detail on some of these uh, issues and solutions, check out that KIUC seminar from last fall. Also, uh, we would like these devices to be able to provide active and reactive power sharing across the resources. So we want them basically to run on some principle um, similar to Droop. Uh, that a, um, that's very similar to how conventional synchronous generators and grid following inverters work today, but we want them to be able to share uh, power across the system. And then continuing under normal operating conditions, we want robust operations in uh, systems with low system strength. I threw in a little um, thing on the right-hand side. If you're not familiar with those terminologies around low system strength, uh, there's a nice document out there from AEMO, which is the Australian grid operator talking about uh, system strength. And finally, uh, voltage balancing. We want to make sure that we um, don't actively oppose or prevent the flow of negative sequence currents for uh, small levels of voltage imbalance on the grid. So moving on to operations outside normal conditions or abnormal conditions, this is typically where you're going to have faults and the like, um, but we want to ensure that these grid forming inverters exhibit proper ride through behavior. Um, they respond correctly to asymmetrical faults. They have the correct response to abnormal frequency. I threw in a slide from a new EPRI tutorial on grid forming inverters you can see on the right hand side that really is kind of showing you a different, a variety of different response characteristics of devices to disturbances. And we would like grid for, uh, forming technologies really to exhibit proper ride through, ride through behavior for voltage or frequency abnormalities and make sure that they can maintain proper system um, stability. And then in addition, we want to make sure that they respond correctly to phase jumps and voltage steps, as well as correctly um, um, ensuring stable operation when doing things like intentional islanding or creating microgrids. You can see a figure over on the right-hand side of uh, these types of systems may be uh, used in microgrids where parts of the um, system would isolate from the main grid. If you have grid forming inverters inside there, you want to make sure that you're maintaining a stable voltage and frequency in those islanded parts of the system.
Okay, so there's a few more things inside these specifications and in additional grid forming capabilities and considerations. And this is um, a set of things as we were going through this. Um, the prior section really focused on what we would like every single grid forming uh, inverter based resource to be able to do. Now, this is a little bit above and beyond that. So it could be thought of as sort of grid forming plus added um, capabilities that help. Um, in actually operating these types of systems. So one of that could be black start capability. Now, uh, grid forming technologies can all do a black start, but black start um, is really critical uh, in understanding what type of loads you have connected into the system and whether or not your devices can actually provide that service and restart everything. For example, can it actually provide the reactive power needed to energize a transformer or a long um, overhead line? There's a variety of things that need to be taken into account. Again, I'll highlight that um, EPRI recently uh, put together a grid forming inverter tutorial. Some of this information is from that. But that's a nice place if you, again, want to get some more information, you can find that on our Unify, our Unify website, links to that, um, or you can see the website there. Again, it's a way of getting more information on grid forming technologies and products available um, to, the, to people that are interested in this space. But we would like to make sure that what we're able to do is evaluate how grid forming technologies could actually provide this black start capability. Here's some more information, but it highlights uh, some of the critical parameters where you actually um, are interconnecting to a microgrid as an example and having a grid forming inverter. You need to understand things like the uh, transformer inrush current that you would need in order to re Magnet energize the magnet, the magnetic field inside that transformer. That can be a big issue, and it's one of the critical things when thinking about whether your technologies have that black start capability. So um, that that's just something to be aware of, and something that's critical to understand to have this in your system. Some additional things that we looked at would be like communications uh, and secondary response. So if we think about a system operator and how they're actually talking to uh, devices out in the field, what type of communications are they using? Are they making sure they're using a cyber secure communication method? Um, how do they um, enable and make sure that if any of the communications is dropped, that the systems will continue to operate as planned? And then also, how do you send secondary control signals? So that could be like power settings or voltage or frequency settings, but those are usually set points from an operator's perspective as opposed to uh, primary control that's actually built into the autonomous um, inverter-based resources themselves. Again, these will be critical considerations as we think about deployments of massive amounts of inverter-based resources. Another critical thing is looking at the short circuit uh, rated current from devices. Um, most people know that inverter-based resources typically have a much smaller um, fault current response than synchronous generators. That's highlighted in the graph over here where a synchronous generator, you might get six times uh, rated fault current out of the device and that's enough to, to uh, for protective relays to see that condition and then start opening circuit breakers. But with inverter-based resources, um, they're very programmable in terms of how much short circuit current that they put out. They can turn off very quickly. Example is that red line there, or they can ride through examples, but they typically don't have the ability to put out six times uh, current. One of the key things will be specifying exactly what these short circuit characteristics look like so that you can see if they map up to existing protection systems or if those need to be updated when using lots of inverter-based resources. And then finally, constraints due to the input source. Uh, the speed of any response is going to be constrained by the basic limitations of the DC source behind the grid forming inverter. I show an example of three 
uh, different systems here, where one where you have a wind turbine uh, that has got an inverter uh, inside of it, a PV system with an inverter, or a battery bank with an inverter. Each of those are going to have different characteristics that may be able to provide a, a range of services to the grid itself. Now, I ran through the specifications there, but we've started to do some modeling and simulation work on evaluating how simulations at various levels can actually verify some of those specifications. So we can set up a test network. Um, as you see here, we can do a variety of tests, and then those would verify specific sections inside the uh, grid forming specifications themselves. So our modeling and simulation working group has been uh, looking at how we can start to develop um, preliminary models and, and simulations that would verify some of these control systems. I'll just uh, show this really quickly. Um, that we've started to work our way through this, evaluating a range of different grid forming and grid following controls, and then looking at, for example, their response to step changes, um, and then understanding what, uh, what does this look like and how can this help us improve what we're actually putting into the specifications themselves. So is there a specific response characteristic that we may want to highlight? to make sure that we're enabling stable grids into the future. In addition to the modeling and simulation efforts that are going on inside the Unified Consortium, we're setting up uh, some experimental work with actual hardware to help evaluate these specifications. So can we take individual inverters, evaluate them with sort of black box testing, not knowing what type of controls are embedded inside and evaluate whether they would meet the specifications uh, that are outlined in that document. We're starting to set up a large scale one megawatt multi-vendor experiment that'll actually allow us to do not only individual inverter testing, but then start mixing those uh, together with grid forming, grid following, synchronous generators, a variety of different load conditions, and testing and evaluating entire microgrids that have not only multi-vendor grid forming inverters, but various penetration levels um, and emulate realistic conditions. And then at the end, being able to visualize how these types of systems will work in our experiments. There's a variety of work that we're setting up right now in our energy systems integration facility at uh, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So this is kind of a one-line diagram of the layout that we have planned for this, where we'll have several types of uh, systems. We'll have single-phase systems that would replicate uh, grid-forming technologies deployed on residential homes. We could have uh, mixed legacy systems where we have grid forming and grid following technologies as well as synchronous generators. We can start to look at 100% renewable energy systems and inverter-based grids as well as systems that can run individually as small microgrids, say for example, by opening this switch, having the microgrid run independently from the rest of the larger system. So this is quite a complex configuration uh, that we're setting up and getting ready to do over the next uh, year and a half to evaluate whether actual hardware implementations of these specifications can be evaluated. And a lot of this work will be done in our energy systems integration facility at NREL. This is a short little video of the capabilities that we have inside that facility where we can set a wide variety of inverters and test equipment up and evaluate those interconnecting them with um, our grid simulation capabilities and uh, really complex microgrid configurations. Okay, so that kind of talks about the modeling, simulation, the testing, uh, validation that we plan on these specifications, but we are looking for uh, additional inputs, and I threw this slide into today's presentation. If you are interested in providing additional information to us and want to take a short survey, we have one on integration and validation. And you can take that and learn a little bit more about what we're doing in that space. And we also have a, a survey on our controls and middle layer where we're looking at what 
is it possible to develop a middle layer that would enable a lot of the um, specifications to be met at sort of a, a non-proprietary part of the inverter without diving into the deep uh, level controls that are being implemented inside those. So if you have any interest in that, uh, shoot your phone at the screen and grab that QR code and take uh, one of those surveys and give us some more inputs. We'd appreciate it. Okay, so we have gone through one year. We had our one-year uh, birthday party last week. Uh, I want to thank Georgia Tech for hosting our event. Uh, where we got together, shared experience on grid forming inverter technologies, where we want to see the industry move, a lot of great uh, information on the work that's being done inside the consortium itself, and how we can all work together to move this technology forward. And then I also want to highlight here at the end, uh, we are continuing the spring 2023 seminar series. After this week, it'll be the same uh, time on Mondays. Um, and then we have a range of speakers from industry, universities, um, and national labs giving a talk, a variety of different um, uh, things here. Make sure you register for the seminar series and follow us going forward. And with that, I want to say thank you. I also want to say special thanks to all of our Unify Consortium area leads that have been doing a lot of the work that I've presented today and all the members uh, working on the variety of projects that we have. I know uh, we kind of ran through this fairly quickly, but if you want to get more information, uh, you can check out what we've got posted on our website. You can get there by shooting the QR code on the upper right and getting more information about uh, the Unified Consortium. So with that, I'll say thank you, and we'll go ahead and stop here. Thanks so much, Ben.